And let's talk about level design. Okay, so we're talking about level design. Um, so far this semester, we've been focusing on building components and learning how to use a game engine and creating art and putting those things into uh, and combining those things. So taking our art and putting it together with the components of our game. Um, so uh, when we now, when we want to actually create a game, we're going to need a sequence of events. We're going to need to put things together to create a level. And so that's what we're going to talk about this week. And we'll spend a little bit of time building a level. Um, so a level is, you know, I think everybody knows what, what I mean when I say level. But to be specific, in video games, a level is typically defined spatially. Um, so that's not always the case, but that's the typical case. Um, the level uh, includes all the space that a player can navigate at the current stage of the game. So you have multiple, most games are made up of multiple levels and parameters, certain things can change between those levels. So some levels, you know, uh, we can see the whole thing. Like if we think about Pac-Man, we can see the whole level from the beginning. And actually the map of Pac-Man stays the same as you progress through the levels. What changes is the difficulty. Um, in other games, levels have distinct visuals. Like in Mario, you can think about you could probably picture the first level pretty easily. Uh, you might be able to picture the underground level, the second level. Uh, after that, it might get a little bit harder to picture other levels, but each level has kind of a distinct look to it in Mario. In some games, like Pac-Man, the entire space is visible at the beginning. In many games, we have to navigate through the space to reveal sort of the boundaries or the, the totality of the level. So a lot of games that we're making in class will probably fit into that second category where as we move through the space, we'll discover more parts of the level. Although some of the games that you guys have talked about uh, would be more of like a Pac-Man style top down where there's one map and you see everything happening on that map. So here we see Pac-Man. And this is in part because Pac-Man is, is an old game, right? If we look up the Pac-Man sprite sheet, Maybe you guys have seen this before. Um, but it basically looks like this, where all of the art for the game is contained in this one image. So you could imagine making this in Pascal, right? Like you'd have to, you know, draw the title, draw all your different frames, draw the level, and then export it. And this doesn't change because the game had to be very small to fit on an early uh, arcade game processor. So they just have this one big image and they just draw different parts of that image for the different animations and the map and things like that. And what changes from level to level, as I mentioned, is not the map itself, but the difficulty of the level. So different parameters that determine the gameplay change. So most games have a sequence of levels. That could be a sequence of increasing difficulty or a sequence of different spaces or different types of sequences. Levels often represent a larger section or a section of a larger space or a world. Um, you could imagine you know, zooming out and seeing a map and then certain levels are tied to different parts of the map. In one level, a player typically has to solve different puzzles or defeat a challenge to finish the level and advance to the next one. And typically, levels tend to increase in difficulty. So once we beat level one, we've learned some various skills. And so then we go to level two, and the game becomes more difficult to make it uh, more challenging and more interesting to the player. From a technical perspective, a level is just a collection of data. And usually, it has references to the, the components that make up our game. Like it'll have a reference to the player. It'll have a reference to our obstacles, to our sprite sheets, our maps, different things like that. And that data provides a recipe for the game engine to build the level while it's being run by the user. So the level file is going to contain references to all of the media that we use, like uh, programming scripts, images, and audio files, fonts, if we have those, and other resources that make up the level. 
Here, you might recognize some of the terminology. This is a screenshot of a Godot level that is uh, open in a text editor. And we can actually do that with any of our levels on uh, our projects right now. You could go in and you could actually edit this text and it would change the way that the level is set up. I don't recommend doing that because it can be tricky, uh, but you can see that when we design our level, what it's doing is it's creating this file that has references to all the different scenes, it has uh, different values that you know, are saved that represent our map, like our tile set here. Uh, and this file is very small, right? It's much smaller than if we actually created like an image of the whole map. And so when we ship our game, when we export it and send it to another computer, that uh, you know, computer will read this file and recreate the level for the user. Uh, here's another screenshot. You can see uh, the tile data is just this like big long list of numbers of where tiles go in the scene. Uh, you can see like the node name is platforms, type is tile map. So there's all this stuff in here uh, that uh, you know is just how what we created when we build the level. So you theoretically could create an entire level just by editing a text document if you have a really good sense of you know how things work. Uh, you also might use code to you know, generate a document. But what Godot does to make it easier for us as game designers is we can create a level visually. So there's a lot of different editors uh, or game engines that let us do that. Uh, here's an example uh, of a level editor from this Wikipedia about different types of level creation tools, which actually has a lot of cool information on it. And you can see this is an older editor, but it looks very similar to Godot. It has, this looks up here, you can see this map looks a lot like our node tree or our scene view. Down here, you can see a tile sheet. Here you can see the level view. Uh, there's a, you know, buttons at the top that do various things. So it's very similar to Godot, uh, but it's an earlier version of a level editor. So, in the early days of video game development, most levels and you know studios had their own design, their own programs for editing levels. So a developer would build a program, and designers would you know create and add levels that get uh, created by the game engine. And those tools have really changed over time to this extent that we have very sophisticated software like Godot or Unity or other game engines where we can have the separation between the designers who are creating levels and the programmers who are building the engine that makes the game run. And so level designers in today's terms don't have to be programmers necessarily. They can just be visual designers that use the visual tools to create levels. Here's uh, ZZT's level designer. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about indie games last week. Francis, just saying hi. Hi. Right. Uh, this is a really cool website that goes into the history of ZZT, and it shows this like level design tool. So this is very early uh, in terms of you know game development, uh, and so the tool is much more simplistic and you know graphically simple, but it does all the same stuff that Godot does. We can create graphics, we can create maps, we can add components. Uh, and add scripts and do all this other stuff. So some games like ZZT share level editing tools with different players. You could probably think of certain games that have done that, like Doom uh, and Half-Life are a couple of famous examples of very uh, successful games that shared their level creation tools, and that allowed users to create new levels and mods and different games based on those level designs. The Stanley Parable is uh, definitely one of the most famous examples of this. It's a video game that's uh, using the Half-Life uh, source engine, uh, but is a very, very different game. It has similar graphics, but it's a narrative game uh, where you're not you know, shooting aliens and uh, traveling to outer space and stuff like that. You're walking around an office and there's a, a story that is built into it. 
So uh, because these design tools have been kind of like let uh, into the world for people to use, new games have been created that may not have existed before. And that adds to the sort of history and legacy of the original games as well. Um, so, you know, the relation, like the Stanley Parable is its own game now. You can buy it on Steam. And I think we talked earlier in the semester about the new version of it, uh, which I haven't had a chance to play yet. Uh, you played the new version? Is it good? Okay. Yeah, I really want to play that one when I have it, have it, have time. Uh, another way that levels are created, and this uh, is an example of the Binding of Isaac, which we talked a little bit about a few weeks ago. Um, and this article kind of goes into the level generation tool that's used for this. So another way that we can create levels is actually by generating them from code. So we're probably not going to do this this semester, but it's an interesting topic if you're uh, you know, interested in programming uh, called procedural generation. This is something that I am a big fan of. I use this a lot in my own work. Uh, so in procedural generation, rather than uh, you know, coding everything, uh, or sorry, designing everything visually, you write a, an algorithm or a program that has rules that determines how levels are built, and then the game engine builds those levels, you know, with different parameters every time. This is comes from Rogue and Roguelike games, as we've discussed in previous classes. So we've talked a little bit about level design. And now let's talk about some different principles that we'll apply to creating a level when we do in Godot. So uh, level design principles are not rules. They're more like guidelines to help our process of designing. So not every game has to have the exact same principles, but these ideas will help us think about what we're doing when we create a game. Uh, like any other art form, level design requires a process of discovery through practice. So nobody designs a perfect level the first time they try it. We have to you know, come up with an idea for a level, we have to you know, build that level, and then we have to go back and revise to get it to work the way we want it to. A lot of, you might think that like, you, know, you just sit down and you just throw the level on the page, uh, but actually thinking through the process of the level and what's happening at various points will help you uh, you know, do a, a more efficient uh, process and uh, ultimately create more engaging levels. So we'll talk about a few of these principles. And you may not have heard these terms before, but I would guess that when I describe them, you'll be able to pretty quickly imagine different games that you've played over the years that use these principles. So the first one is guidance. This is pretty simple. This is what uh, this is referring to guiding the player through the level. And part of that is, you know, guiding them through the space of the level, but it's also guiding them through the mechanics of the game. So some games will just have like a tutorial at the beginning that says, you know, press space to jump and, uh, you know, you need to find this many secret keys or whatever the challenge is. Some games will use more implicit uh guidance to you know use visuals or other indicators to show you where you should go and how you should play the game so here we see a broken down uh image of the first world in mario and by removing some of the graphics we can see the more formal elements of the game design so we can see certain things like uh, the directionality of different components our character is going to the right and our enemies are coming from the right to the left. And we have objects in the sky which indicate to us, you know, we see this object here and so we know that we're going to have to get over that object so that indicates to us that we can jump in this scene. So it sounds very simplistic but if a player starts a game and they don't know what the rules are or what the parameters are or you know that they can jump, we need to use either explicit or implicit cues to explain to the player or guide the player through what they can do in the game world. We also want to introduce the goal of the game. So for 
when we start a level, the goal should always be very clear to the player so they know what they're supposed to be doing and what the point of the level and the point of the game overall is. Sometimes that goal might be kind of abstract or mysterious, like, uh, you know, uh, some kind of like narrative or uh, some kind of mystery. But even if we don't know exactly what the ultimate ending of the game will be, we should still know generally what the goal of the game is. So even if the goal is exploring, it should be clear that there's a reason that we're exploring, that there's something that we'll reveal through the exploration. Sometimes uh, uh, just having something cool, like a visual thing that we can discover is enough of a goal. But a lot of the time it's some type of reward, like you know saving a character or gaining a new item or getting points or you know, getting a high score or something like that. So after guidance, we have obstacles and rewards. We've talked about this a bunch and we've been designing our obstacles and rewards recently. So once we establish the basic mechanics and goals of the game, we want to introduce the obstacles and the rewards and how to deal with them. So obstacles and rewards are used to complicate the experience of the level. So it's not just, you know, walking down the street. Uh, and make the level more fun. Obstacles and challenges should be fun, engage the player so that they can learn the uh, mechanics of the game. And it should be, if it's fun, if it's challenging, it will lead the player to want to play the game more. And then rewards need to reinforce the goals of the game and lead the player towards the mastery of the mechanics. So a lot of time, an obstacle, you'll you know learn how to jump or... Uh, do some type of mechanic because there's an obstacle, but rewards are another way that we can teach the player the mechanics. If there's a special uh, item or a coin that's very high in the sky, then we'll say, oh, we need to figure out how to get up there, and that will teach us more about how to play the game. Uh, in this one, we see Sonic with our rings. So there's always a very clear example of what we're going for the whole time. We're collecting these rings. And there's also these extra challenges. So you don't get every ring just by playing it uh, in a you know straightforward way. You have to do extra things within the game to get uh, a lot of the rings. So another principle uh, that I like to consider, I don't know if this one is quite as universal as the first two that we covered, but I think it's a good one to keep in mind, is the perfect player principle. This principle basically says that there should be, in theory, a perfect player who can complete your level without ever having played the game before and without ever having you know, learned anything about the mechanics or having any prior knowledge of the game itself. So this is a little bit abstract, but what this basically says is that in a game, if you've just started, the game should be showing you how to play enough that if you're really good at gaming, you will be able to beat the level even if you have no idea what you're supposed to be doing when you first start. That's usually not the case. Most players will make mistakes and they'll return to the beginning of the level and they'll try again. But in theory, your level shouldn't be tricking players or you know, introducing things that the player is not prepared for along the process. Uh, <laughs> I use this example of... Uh, this game called N, which I think is a really good example of the uh, perfect player principle. I don't know if you guys have played this before, but it's a really, really difficult uh, platformer with just like a high level of difficulty with lots of crazy physics. Uh, but it does meet like the perfect player principle. Like each one of these levels on its own will show you how to play it if you are, you know, extremely talented, which I'm not. Uh, but we can watch a little bit of this. So you can see they're very complex levels, but it shows you everything you need to know to be able to beat the game. Uh, if you try playing this game, you'll see what I mean, uh, but it's also very frustrating. Uh, another uh, important principle, again, not something that's really universal, but I think is a good one to keep in mind, is the idea of unique levels. So that means that every level 
should be different enough from the previous level that it stands out as a unique level. So a good an example of a good game is like if I name a level or describe a level, another person who's played that game will immediately know what I'm talking about because each level is distinct enough that there's something that you can describe that separates it from the other levels. If your levels aren't unique, your game will start to feel like you just have random levels just for the sake of adding levels, and that'll get boring for a lot of players. So a game that I think is a great example of this principle is Psychonauts. Uh, this is kind of an old game, so I don't know if you guys have maybe played this, uh, but it was a really, uh, I don't know if it was really popular, but I think it was a very influential game uh, for N64. Um, and every level in that game is like really different from every other level to the extent that, uh, you know, you could name any level. And if you played that game, you would know, you would immediately have an idea of which level you're talking about. And I think the Milkman Conspiracy is like probably the most famous one, uh, where, you know, for big fans of that game, people will immediately know what you're talking about. They'll probably have memories of playing that level, uh, you know. They'll, you know, have this like immediate reaction uh, to to this uh, to remembering this game. So it sounds like a couple of people played it. Oh, and there's a recent sequel. I think I saw something for that, but I didn't. I don't really know about it. I'll have to look into that. Um, but yeah, if you haven't played that game, I definitely recommend it. I don't know if it's available now on like new platforms. Maybe it's on like Switch or something. Uh, this one, the Psychonauts. So another uh, uh, principle that we want to keep in mind is the idea of pacing. So uh, our level should present a series of challenges. It shouldn't end too quickly, and it shouldn't become repetitive. So you want to introduce the challenges, but if you're just you know lining up a bunch of uh, different obstacles, but there's nothing there's no change in between, then eventually the level is going to start to get boring. So we want to change the pacing, even if it's very simple, even a really simple game like um, uh, Flappy Bird, if you guys, I'm sure you guys know what that is, like nothing ever changes in that game, but it's it's always getting faster. So the pacing has to do with the speed that the game is changing, and that becomes part of the challenge. So if a game has too many challenges, it's going to be too difficult. If it has not enough challenges or the same challenges over and over again, it's going to start to get boring. Um, this, this example, uh, I actually do like this game a lot, but the Ocarina of Time. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an example of a game of a level that's really frustrating because you have to repeat tasks so many times and you have to keep going back and doing things over and over again and you have to go through this phase every time. So even though it's a great level in terms of its design, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a success in terms of its pacing. And a lot of uh, you know players over the years have complained about that level. Okay, so those are some principles. There's a lot more, and I'll link to some articles at the end of this uh, of this lecture for you guys to check out as well. So again, these are just guidelines. They're not absolute rules, but they're things to think about when you start uh, designing a level. So now I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, which is level design techniques. So these are things that we actually do within the level that work with our uh, with our principles to actually create the level. So signposting is any time that we're giving instructions. So this is related to guidance, but this is in terms of giving literal instructions. What do we do on the screen to show people what to do? So this might be like a sign that says go here. This might be a character that tells you, you know, that you have to find some specific item. Uh, this might be visual signals to direct the player in one direction or another. So anytime we add signposting, uh, that can be, you know, all these different types. We're doing some type of guidance usually. So an example here, there's just a little sign that says go this way. Very literal uh, example of signposting. But a lot of times signposting can be other things within the game that just tell us where we want to go. 
Gating is another technique that you'll see in a lot of games. This is restricting access to an area within a level or to another level. So this requires a player to find some type of key, which can be like a literal item like a, that looks like a key, or it could be a figurative key, like the answer to a riddle or the answer to a uh, puzzle that will open uh, that area for us. Uh, the ice key in uh, Banjo-Kazooie is a good example of this. Uh, very difficult to find this key. Uh, I don't see any, I guess that's the only image on here. There's no video. Anyway, just an example of a key and gating. Risk versus reward is another technique that we'll use in our level. So this is where uh, if a player takes a risk, they will be given a reward. So they're given options, essentially. So the risk, the player will have to evaluate the level of risk versus the reward that they'll get. So this is a very common uh, thing used in games where if you want to get you know, some more difficult to reach rewards, it's going to be harder to get there but you have the option to just ignore that and just you know, beat the level. So that, makes, that gives a player agency and choice and adds challenges to the game. Um, Blood Gulch is a good example of this one, uh, where there's a high level of risk versus reward that is built into the gameplay. I don't know if you guys, I actually don't, I'm not really like a big Halo player, but I've heard a lot about this level uh, where it's very, it's very challenging. It's you know, team on team action and it's you have to take lots of uh, high risk uh, maneuvers in order to be successful in this level. Uh, safe zone is another technique that a lot of games use where there's a safe area where the player can see what's going on in the game and evaluate the best way forward. So in uh, Space Invaders there's a very obvious example of this where if you're behind one of these green uh, barriers, you can't be killed by the aliens, and so you can view what's happening in the level, and you can design your strategy to uh, incorporate those safe areas and take different risks versus, and uh, you know, take risks to uh, attack the aliens. In this one, part of the game dynamic is your safe areas erode over time. So the longer you play the level, your safe areas will start to disappear. So that's another component of this level design. Foreshadowing is another uh, technique where we reveal things to the player before they happen. So we might reveal to the player that there are some really dangerous enemies coming up with it before we actually force them to deal with those enemies. Um, we might reveal to the player that there's some very exciting rewards that are coming at the end of the level before they've reached the end of the level. So that will kind of give them a motivation to make it through the level. Um, this is a game called The Outer Wilds, which I, I'm, is like my favorite game of the last few years. Um, I really highly recommend this game if you've never played it. It's like a really fun uh, sort of puzzle platformer, but it's like set in space and it has really cool physics and mechanics. And this is just a good example where I won't uh, spoil it, but this is the first thing you see when you open the game. And you don't know it until, very, until a lot later in the game. But there's a lot of information in this image that tells you what you're going to be looking for um, as you, you know, progress in the game. And so at a certain point, you realize what, what you're looking at, and it really changes uh, your understanding of what's happening in the game. So that's a good example of foreshadowing. Uh, branching is a bit like risk and reward. We're giving the player multiple options to complete a challenge, avoid an obstacle, uh, collect a reward, or reach a goal. Bottlenecking is kind of the opposite of uh, branching. So branching is like if your player is going along and you have two options to go down two different roads. Bottlenecking is when we bring those two options back together to uh, converge on some type of challenge or perhaps the end of a level. This is a uh, chart from a, a really good article that's more about like uh, sort of like choose your own adventure style games. Um, but it could really apply to any type of game where there's these different sort of narrative styles that show uh, choices that the player has in these different types of narratives. Um, and this is just a good example that shows both branching and bottlenecking. So when this orange 
node branches out into uh, the five yellow nodes, that shows that the player has five options. But then all these five options bottleneck into this second orange node over here. So by using branching and bottlenecking, we can give the player lots of different options, but still keep them on the same general path towards the end of our level. Layering is when we combine multiple game mechanics. So this is when if we have obstacles and then, so we see some obstacles then we see some rewards, then we see obstacles and rewards at the same time that it increases the challenge and forces the player to make uh, more decisions as they're playing the game. So Mega Man is a really good example of layering. It does. It's also, you know, it's a, Mega Man is really like a great example of all of these principles. Um, if you guys have played Mega Man, uh, it you've never heard of it. It's very hard. Uh, I'm not very good at it, but it's like a really good game in terms of fundamental level design techniques. So in Mega Man, it starts out. Uh, <laughs> I swear, in my child. That's funny. Um, it starts out where you know it's pretty it, it it it's it's pretty it's you know it's a platformer, but there's you have like uh, different different sort of like attack methods, and there's lots of different type of enemies and stuff like that. Um, and uh, it sounds like we do have some Mega Mega Man fans here. Uh, so uh, one of the things, if you play Mega Man and think about these principles, you'll notice that. They always like introduce something to you and then you get used to it and then they introduce something else to you and then they stick both of them together. So sometimes that's like enemies, but other times it's like jumps or, you know, uh, different mechanics like the slide, different things like that. They show you how to do things and they the game forces you to learn how to do different things. And then once you've learned those things, it starts to layer them together. So you have to think about multiple things at the same time. Um, so you can see all the different components of this level uh, and how they get, and then they get layered together. Um, okay, so again, some principles, some techniques, not exhaustive, but those are some of the ones that we'll look at as we do our uh, demo. So these are a bunch of articles that kind of go into further uh, detail on these principles. Um, this level design lessons is just like a big PDF with lots of examples uh, that you can just download and, and read through. It's free. Um, so that's a good one if you want more detail on uh, these uh, principles. Um, this is a video. Oh, this is like, this is a really good talk uh, by a game designer who I think works at NYU. Uh, yeah, it looks like NYU is on here. And this is kind of, this talk really touches on a lot of different things, but it talks a lot about level design, uh, principles, and uh, various other uh, kind of uh, aspects of game development. And it's, it's one of the best talks I've seen on game design. This is another video series with a designer talking about uh, some principles that they use when they're approaching a level design um, and talking about like a lot of like unique levels, how to make different levels unique and talking using a game that they're working on as an example. Another YouTube series of uh, level design tips uh, with Again, a developer who's showing examples from a game that they're working on with lots of different styles of levels. This article on design patterns in 2D games. Design patterns is like kind of another term for techniques, like different ideas to use. You can see there's a lot of similar ones to what we talked about uh, in here. And there's a lot of different examples of these principles uh, with different examples of games and descriptions. This is a website that's just like totally dedicated to level design and writing about it. It has like news articles um, with like lots of different uh, links to different articles, people talking about it, and then resources uh, with articles, interviews, all this different stuff, uh, knowledge base. There's just like tons and tons of stuff on here. So you can find information about any different types of levels, 
uh, different types of games, um, lots of other stuff. Uh, another website, World of Level Design. Uh, this one's taking a while. Let's come back. Procedural level generation. If this is something you're interested in, this is a good article to read. You can do this with Godot. It's kind of hard, so we're not really going to learn it in class. But uh, it's something if you wanted to do, you could do it. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, you could start there. Um, see if this article, OK. So yeah, another site with just like a lot of tutorials and articles on level design. So there's a lot of different stuff here that you can kind of look into um, when it comes to level design. Um, so yeah, that's it for our uh, lecture. So let's go back to the schedule. And so let's just get started a little bit with a demo. Um, I'll stop recording this part.